Hi everyone, welcome to Ahmed Academy. This video will cover the 3D morphology of the permanent maxillary canines. Before we begin talking about the morphology of the canines, I want to give you guys a brief introduction about this type of tooth in regards to its development, eruption, uh, root formation and their primary function. Both the maxillary and the mandibular canines are called the cornerstones of the mouth and separate the molars from the incisors. Maxillary canines have the longest root of any tooth and are also the longest tooth in total length and are also slightly wider than the mandibular canines. So all of these features put together, this provides extra anchorage to the tooth in the jaw and the way its crown is shaped um, it provides self-cleansing qualities so whenever teeth are lost naturally canines are usually the last ones to go they develop from four lobes of calcification three forming the incisal mamelons and one giving rise to the palatal surface. The crown will conclude its development around the age of six to seven, allowing the tooth to erupt around the age of 11 to 12, with its root being completely formed by the age of 13 to 15. It usually takes about two to three years once uh, the tooth has erupted into the oral cavity for the for its root to be completely formed the primary function is for shearing cutting occlusal guidance during lateral excursion of the mandible and structural support for the lips and the facial muscles there is a single cusp present on the canines in nearly all permanent maxillary canines there is one root canal with one root apex we're looking at the morphology from four different viewing aspects starting from the labial then moving on to the palatal and finishing off with the mesial and distal we might touch on um, the occlusal or the incisal aspect as well towards the end as a bonus so stay tuned for that as well so before we begin please hit that subscribe button as we're going to be covering the whole dentition and give this video a like for the purpose of this video we're going to be using the left maxillary canine so the right hand side is distal the left hand side is mesial so number one is the labial viewing aspect of the tooth this view considers the surface of the tooth facing the lips the cervical line is convex with the convexity facing towards the root. Mesially, the crown is convex from the cervical line to the contact area. And the contact area is at the junction of the incisal and middle third. So if you can uh, observe the mesial side of the crown, uh, there's a convexity that runs from the cervical line to the contact area and now comparing that to the distal side of the crown distally the crown is concave and that concavity runs from the cervical line till the contact area which lies in the center of the middle third and it's nicely represented by that little shadow representing the concavity on that side the cusp tip is on a line with the center of the root so if you drew a line from the cusp tip it will go through the center of the root and uh, potentially um, crosses the root apex as well so moving on to the cusp tip again is formed by these nice uh, mesial and distal slopes and usually the mesial slope is shorter than the distal slope so this can be a key feature to allow you uh, to recognize whatever tooth you're working with whatever canine that you're working with if it's the right canine or the left canine uh, or to identify which surface is the mesial or the distal because always the mesial slope is going to be shorter than the distal slope shallow depressions mesially and distally dividing the three labial lobes so you have this cent central convexity uh, on the crown and then you have these shallow depressions either side and they sort of divide uh, are a line um, a division between the three lobes that the labial surface is formed from 
The root appears slender, conical in form with a bluntly pointed apex. Number two considers the palatal viewing aspect of the tooth. This is the surface of the tooth facing the palate. From this viewing aspect, we can observe that the crown and the root are narrower. The palatal part of the root is narrower than the labial. Much of the mesial and distal surfaces are to be seen from this aspect. The lingual ridge of the root is narrower, smooth and convex, extending from the cervical line till the apex. Essentially, these three points, what they mean is that from looking at the tooth from this viewing aspect, um, the, whole, the, the, the tooth as a whole looks narrower. Um, um, the crown and the root. So this lingual ridge that runs um, along the root from the cervical line to the root apex uh, is narrower, allowing us to um, observe the mesial surface of the root and the distal surface of the root uh, from this plateau aspect. Um, and the same applies to the crown. Moving on, the cervical line shows a more even curvature than that found on the labial aspect. On the labial aspect, it was convex towards the um, root, uh, towards the root, to the root apex. In uh, the palatal aspect, we can see it has a more even curvature. The cingulum is large and sometimes pointed um, like a small cusp. Um, a well-developed lingual longitudinal ridge is seen in the confluent with a cusp tip shallow concavities are present either side of the longitudinal ridge and the two marginal ridges these depressions are called the mesial and the distal lingual fossae so as you can see from the cingulum um, to the cusp tip uh, runs a longitudinal uh, lingual ridge um, that either side has shallow depressions called lingual fossae. Fossae means depressions um, and either side of the fossae uh, away from the lingual longitudinal ridge are other ridges which are called um, distal uh, ridges and mesial ridges respectively. Number three the mesial aspect. This view considers the surface of the tooth facing towards the midline of the face. From this aspect, we can observe that the tooth presents the outline of the functional form of an anterior tooth. So it's quite similar um, in outline form to the anterior tooth that we have covered before, the central maxillary uh, incisor uh, and the lateral maxillary incisor, which uh, by the way, if you haven't checked out, will be in the cards above. It also shows greater bulk and greater labial palatal measurement than any other anterior teeth. So the measurement um, in its most bulky segment of the crown, if you measured it from the labial side to the palatal side, this measurement is the greatest compared to any other anterior teeth. The crown is wedge-shaped the greatest width lies in the cervical third. So um, the crown overall is described as wedge-shaped and the greatest width um, that we spoke about previously lies in this cervical third close to the cervical line. The crest of curvature is found at a level more incisal, so at a more incisal direction than the incisors because the three labial lobes uh, that form the labial surface of the tooth are more highly developed. Um, so the contact point, the area that makes contact with neighboring tooth are more incisally placed compared to the, the two incisors that we covered before. The cervical line curves towards the cusp on average by approximately 2.5 millimeters. The root may curve labially towards the apical third. However, in this model is uh, pointing distally. And finally, the distal view. 
This considers the surface of the tooth facing away from the midline of the face. From this viewing aspect, we can observe that it is similar to the mesial aspect with the following variations. The cervical line exhibits less curvature towards the cusp ridge. So if you remember in the mesial aspect, um, it exhibited a curvature on average of about 2.5 millimeters and on the distal aspect it's usually less than 2.5 millimeters. Mesial is more curved and distal is less curved. The surface displays more concavity usually above the contact points. So if you remember in the labial aspect when we spoke about the concavity on the right hand side um, which was kind of nicely shown on this model with that little shadow. Um, this is more pronounced when we look at it from the distal view um, and it's usually above that contact point. The developmental depression on the distal side of the root is more pronounced. So if you can see from the cervical line to the apex, there's a depression that runs all along uh, and it's more pronounced in the distal side than the mesial side. The bonus part that I want to cover um, is the incisal aspect. This is the view looking directly down at the chewing surface of the tooth. From here we can observe that the labial lingual dimension is greater than the mesial distal dimension. So uh, what this means is that the measurement from the um, labial to the palatal side, this measurement is uh, greater than the measurement from made from the mesial to the distal side. The entire distal portion looks as if stretched to make contact with the first premolar. So if you compare the, um, the distal side to the mesial side, it sort of looks stretched uh, relative to the other side um, to make contact with the premolar. The ridge of the middle labial lobe is very noticeable labially. It attains the greatest convexity at the cervical third of the crown, becoming broader and flatter at the middle and incisal third. So, um, so this middle labial lobe um, is very noticeable labially. Uh, and it, its greatest convexity is seen um, at the cervical third and it becomes broader and flatter um, as you go uh, move towards the um, uh, to the incisal third and the middle third. The cingulum makes up the cervical third palatally with a shorter arc than the middle labial lobe. And with that being said, this brings us to the end of the video. So well done if you made it this far. Please consider leaving a like if you thought it was helpful and subscribe for more as we'll be covering the whole dentition as well as more videos relating to dentistry and medicine. All the sources that made this video possible, their links can be found in the description section below. And as always, feel free to pause, screenshot and use this summary sheet for your own independent study. Peace.